In March and April last year, the stock market went crazy. We were just about to go into lockdown and the stock market smashed into the floor. Everyone thought the world was going to end and started selling off their stocks. Nobody knew what was going to happen. A couple of weeks later, the stock market rallied. It went on this massive run. The S&P 500 was up like 40%. Tesla was up like 800% or something. Plug power even better. And in late 2020 and early 2021, people really started catching on and started getting into more and more speculative and riskier stocks. Now we're in April 21 and some of those guys that got into the market and into risky speculative stocks are now holding the bag. And it's really tough for me this week because this week I've had a lot of messages saying, I can't take this anymore. I want to quit investing. I never should have got into investing. And some of them have been quite hard to read. Now, I'm not going to show them on here because I think a lot of them are very personal and quite emotional. But I've been seeing them on Instagram DMs. There's a lot of people switching out on Discord, especially in the SPAC section of the Discord. And also we're seeing a lot more lost porn on Reddit. And I'm actually seeing quite a few little comments in the Trading212 social area. There's a bit of despair out there and I, I really don't know what to say. So today I'm planning on looking at what exactly has been going on in the market and why these people are all leaving. I'm going to take a look at how the market might look going forward. Now we're heading into the new roaring 20s. And then I want to show you how I'm positioning myself for the future, how I'm investing to maybe mitigate some of these crazy circumstances that are going right now. So I'll do a quick update on my portfolio as I regularly do. And then I'll do a little tickle on crypto as well. So stick around for that. I don't think this is going to be a 45 minute episode like it was last week. I'm going to try and keep this as small as possible. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. Welcome back everyone, my name is Paul. Up. I'm brand new to investing and I've started a dividend investment portfolio on Trading212. This channel is all about me trying to invest in the stock market, learning new things every week and trying to display exactly what I'm doing. So if anyone who's looking back at these videos from the future while they're on Mars flying in their Tesla hover cars, they can figure out what the best way to invest is. And if this was the best way to invest, then yes, stick around and learn a lot more. But if this turns out to be a terrible way to invest, then this is something to learn from and you can figure out where I went wrong. Every week I learn something new and this week I'm trying to get my head around people losing a lot of money. Because even though loads of stimulus money has gone out there to all the families in America, not a lot of it has actually ended up in the market this time. In March last year, loads of it went in, loads of it banged all into Tesla. And this time, people are actually kind of keeping it, whether they're putting it into alternative investments or crypto or just using the money to eat like you're supposed to. But this has meant that retail traders have kind of started to dwindle off a bit. And a lot of people have been left holding bags now in short squeezes and YouTube pump and dump schemes, mainly around SPACs and penny stocks. And I didn't really believe it until Yahoo Finance released this graphic, which showed just how much activity has been lost on Robinhood since the meme stock week. You know that week where GME and AMC had loads and loads of press going on? Well, Robinhood went from 2 million users to 5 million users just in that week. And since then, Robinhood activity has really started to tail off, along with a lot of other brokers that are on the market. And unfortunately, I have had a lot of messages, a lot of messages like blaming trading two on two, trying to get their money back in some way. Like I said, I don't want to release these messages because some of them are quite emotional and some people are seeing their accounts 20 and 30% down and just want to quit, cut their losses and run away. I truly don't know what the answer to this is, but I do know that these people have not really considered their risk. Even on the Discord, the SPAC section is still going pretty strong. There are a lot of people who are really holding on there and really digging in, but it has got a lot quieter recently, I noticed. But I do know a lot of people in here have either completely sold out at a loss or are shifting back into value. 
But what I will say is there was nothing wrong with getting into those SPACs. If you genuinely were happy putting your money into those and you were happy to let that ride out for years and years and years, we're talking 20 odd, 20, 30 years maybe. If you were happy with it going that long, then it was probably right for you. If you're sitting there at a loss right now and ready to sell out or very worried about the rest of your money going down the drain, then you might just need to sit there reevaluate what you're thinking and I don't know, maybe learn a lesson or something like that. But what you've got to remember is the next crash is coming for all of us. Everyone is going to suffer at some point. I mentioned last week that the stock market, and this is the S&P 500, goes up in steps. So it goes on a long period of pretty much no gains over the course of quite a long time. Then we have those massive bull runs, another bit of sideways movement, another big massive movement, and it continues sideways movement back up. These sideways movements last a long time. The Roaring Twenties in 1929 lasted 27 years. It was 27 years before you got your money back. If you bought right here at the top in 1929, it would have taken you until 1955 to start seeing returns again. That is a crazy amount of time. But it doesn't stop there. After the war, we had an awesome boom, which lasted... I don't know, like 10 years, something like that. But in 1965, we had 17 years of just pure flatness. That lasted until about 1980. And then we had another nice bull run lasting about 20 years with the Reagan era, which ended up finally in the big tech boom of 2000. And then once the tech bubble collapsed, we had another 15 years of just pure flat. Exactly when you thought things were going well, the 2008 crisis came and just destroyed everyone again. Since then, we've had an awesome 10 years. We've had 10 years of absolute pure bull runnage. There's no doubt to pretty much anyone that the S&P 500 is now in a huge overvalued situation. It might be that the S&P 500 has never been this overvalued. And what we're starting to see right now with the drop in these SPACs, and I don't believe that the SPACs are going to be down forever. I do think they probably are going to come up for another massive parabolic move. What we are seeing right now is that investors are either getting a little bit bored or a little bit scared that stocks don't always go up. And if it is true that inflation is coming with all the fiscal stimulus and all the furlough schemes, then the central banks will have to raise interest rates, which will cause a big problem in the stock market. When interest rates go up, stocks go down. And this could be very similar to what we saw between the years 1965 and 1980. That's about 15 to 17 years of pure nothingness. But believe it or not, not everyone in these market crashes loses money. Like in the tech bubble, you had a huge company like Intel lose 77% of its value all the way to 2009. And that's something I don't think people have got their head around yet. The crash doesn't just last like a year or two. Intel lost most of its value within the first two years, but it continued on for another nine years to lose value. To be honest with you, I don't even know if I could stomach that sort of loss. And even to this day, Intel is still 15, Intel, Intel is still 15% down from its all time highs. Can you believe it? One of the biggest companies in the world still is nowhere near its all time high. Famously, Cisco is another one which lost about 80% of its value, but it did lose that value up until about 2002. From 2002, it did actually go on a nice long run of appreciation. So you didn't actually have to wait that long before it started to recover. But from all time highs, Cisco is still 30% down. And believe me, if they had YouTube and Reddit back in the year 2000, Cisco would have been that stock where everyone was banging on about it. I do need to show you the Tesla graph in comparison to the Intel graph because it is so, so similar to what's going on right now. And check out Plug Power. I must have been called something different in 2000. But oh my God, it's still, even though it's had that massive run this year, it's still 97% down. It's crazy to think that this is what happens regularly in the stock market and this time might not be different. So what possible ways are there for protecting ourselves from these massive crashes? So at all times, it's very important to consider your risk and consider really what you might be losing. And personally, I attribute a lot of risk to overvaluation. I'm personally not likely to be able to tolerate really bad capital depreciation when the company isn't earning anything. 
And my plan is to potentially protect myself or at least soften the blow from these crashes by buying into really solid businesses, well-known businesses with high cash generation. Because a guy called Chuck Carnival once told me it's not a stock market, it's a market of stocks. And while Intel and Cisco were losing 70, 80% of their value, stocks like Johnson & Johnson and 3M actually did pretty well. Johnson & Johnson only lost about 13% in the tech bubble. And from 2001 to 2009, Johnson & Johnson actually appreciated 7.4%. Remember, throughout this entire period, the S&P 500 itself lost 35%. Just think about losing 35%, losing 3% a year for nine years. That has got to be some serious stomach that you've got to hold. Unfortunately, if you're cutting loose after six months of trading in the stock market, you've got a lot, lot worse to come. And while 3M did follow the world down during the financial crisis, during 2001 and 2007, it actually made 69%. So during the tech bubble, not everyone lost. In fact, some companies with really good earnings, with really solid earnings growth, with real proper high cash flow growth, really did do very well. And that's where I am with my portfolio at the moment. I'm looking for very slow growing, very strong companies that still will be relevant in the future. I'm trying my hardest not to have the FOMO and try and get into this buying the dip culture because I don't think the lockdown crash was actually a proper dip. I think there's a lot more horrible, horrible stuff coming ahead that we really need to think about. And in that situation, we really want to hold high quality non-speculative companies just so we can get through probably 20 years of pure sideways movement. Again, this is just my plan. This is just the way I'm doing it. It might be completely wrong. It's very possible it's completely wrong, but I would like people to consider it and think and just have all of the information rather than other channels on YouTube, which are just telling you to buy absolutely speculative stocks because I don't know, they've got a product for the future or that, you know, they're not basing it on any real tangible evidence. What I've got here is I've got historical evidence that that in maybe two to three years, we're going to have quite a large crash and it will lead to probably 20 years of sideways movement. In that time, there is going to be amazing growth in some real speculative companies. It's just gonna be very hard for me to find out which ones they are. And there's going to be loads of different reasons why these markets could crash. It could be something like Biden today who wants to raise the taxes on the rich, which has kind of sent a lot of stocks into a bit of a free fall today. Merck losing 1.64%. Tyson Foods taking a big dip at the end of the day here. It has recovered a little bit, but it does show how fickle these markets can be. My portfolio currently sits at 25,185. This portfolio is designed around trading with a sideways mindset. I kind of want to soften the blow of any of the big crashes, any of the real pullbacks with some of the dividends by getting some of the free cash flow from these companies, having them pay back to me for investing into them. The reason I'm not in any growth companies right now is because I simply don't understand how they're going to grow with the climate that's coming in the future. I more don't feel confident in my ability to pick these companies rather than me actually thinking a lot of them are going to go bust. And this week, AT&T has had a pretty excellent earnings report, which has boosted its price by 3%. It's beat its estimates, it's showing good cash flow growth, and actually its growth part of its business, its HBO Max, has done a lot better than Netflix at gaining new subscribers. Netflix this week has had a bit of a tough time because it showed slower growth in its numbers. Um, I think that was a terrible, terrible move. Uh, people who are selling out of Netflix uh, based on that news, that's not smart investing. You should know that this thing is going to slow down a little bit. But AT&T actually posted greater growth numbers of its HBO Max. It also posted greater ARPU than Netflix. ARPU stands for Average Revenue Per User. 
Get used to that phrase. It's going to be an absolutely massive phrase in 2021. No one heard of ARPU in 2020. Now in 2021, everyone is going to be talking about it. Subscription models are going to be absolutely massive and average revenue per user. The average amount of money that these companies gain from every user on their subscription base is going to be a massive metric. This is John Stanky, by the way, the head of AT&T. He's got a famously deep voice, which is probably as close to the brown noise that you can get. You want to maintain the dividend. You want to uh, build out your networks and make everything great with, with wireless. You want to do 5G. Uh, I, I, the criticism is always that Verizon has a, an easier go of it because they can keep their eye on the ball of just, of just one thing. I, I personally think Vestberg would love to be you know, going to the Oscars and stuff like that. But, but is, is there any criticism? Is that valid? at all that, that you've got too many things on your plate and, and you know, expensive things, expensive development, content, all that, and it, it, you're spread too thin. Well, look, What's we, the have, we have a management team that is capable in each of their areas and we don't, uh, you know, I'm not making the decisions on every operating dynamic that's going on in the company day in and day out. I've got really capable leaders running the communications business. I've got a really capable leader running the media business. And, and they're responsible for making those right calls, and I do the stitching and the knitting together where it needs to be stitched and knitted together. Now, what John Stanky has said right there is a very important part of what management needs to do in a very large and very mature business. In much younger businesses like Tesla and Netflix, they need a good founder-led management team run by people like Elon Musk. They need somebody who's very, very hands-on and knows exactly what's going on with the product. In a much bigger company like AT&T with all the assets and all the different revenue streams that are coming in, they need a very good CEO who's very good at stitching together all of the different aspects of their business. And I think that's very important to consider when going forward with these big companies. The management doesn't be, need to be these nimble, exciting people. They need to be people that are very good at their job and good at managing cash flow. And right now, AT&T is a little bit of a risk, I'll admit that. There are issues with its future lines of cash flow. Obviously, analysts think that the cash flow is going to drop over the next couple of years. That's something I haven't looked into yet. But AT&T is still considerably undervalued in my opinion. It's only going to grow really 1% year on year going forward. But in share price term, it could grow 63% over the next three years. Could. A lot of that is going to be helped by its 7% dividend, which I hope that AT&T keeps frozen so it can keep contributing to different parts of its business, growing HBO, maybe paying off some of that debt something like that going forward. I have a lot of confidence going forward and today's numbers that have come out about AT&T only give me a lot more confidence. Another company I'm still very confident in is Bristol Myers Squibb, which is having an awesome run at the moment. But I think it's because there are so many new Bristol Myers Squibb videos that are coming out on YouTube. A lot of the SPAC investors and the penny investors are actually starting to move over to more value investment plays because they've got to get their gains from somewhere, right? And Bristol Myers Squibb is one I've been talking about for probably well over a year now, and I think it's still undervalued. I'm just getting very worried about how much attention it's getting at the moment. I'm ready to put in probably my last amount into Bristol Myers Squibb, just in case it starts to take off sometime soon because it's getting so much attention now. Whenever anyone's talking about a stock and really hyping it up, I just think I don't want to be over there. I want to be somewhere else looking for different types of stocks. I don't want to be just staring at YouTube all day because I think once the news gets onto YouTube or even gets onto the actual news, God, who follows financial news these days? Once it gets to those channels, I think you might be a little bit late. But with Bristol Myers Squibb, I still think it's undervalued. It's definitely undervalued on a cash flow basis. I just think that there isn't a lot of time left for this one. So I'm probably going to buy my last little bits of Bristol Myers Squibb and then leave it to settle, let it do its thing for a long time. And now the famous semiconductor shortage has reached the UK with Jaguar Land Rover suspending two of its factories due to a low supply of chips. This semiconductor shortage is getting a little bit out of hand now. It does mean that semiconductor prices are probably going to go up. But these companies like Broadcom do need to meet their requirements 
to make sure they still earn money off them. But Hot Tan, who is the CEO of Broadcom, one of the companies that I'm invested in, is very confident. And Broadcom says that 90% of its supply has already been ordered by customers. Normally, at this time of the year, 30% of the stock would be ordered up. But at the moment, 90% of it is all ordered up. And Broadcom does say that it still has enough production capability to order even more. So I'm still quite happy with Broadcom going forward. It's had a little bit of a drop in the last month, 2.38%. Uh, I'm 1.73% up on Broadcom. I'm still very happy to be holding it, even though there is a big, big crisis going on with semiconductors right now. And finally, Ethereum and Bitcoin are going absolutely crazy. I haven't touched anything from Ethereum and Bitcoin on my last video, so I'm just seeing how accurate I was. And yeah, I kind of missed a bit here, so uh, I don't know where this resistance line has come from. What I did not expect was for it to shoot back up to all-time highs. That's stupid. <laughs> Bitcoin does not look as good as Ethereum right now. And I'd actually be quite worried that Bitcoin could now come through this resistance point or this support point, sorry, and drop down now to, Jesus, 47,000? Oh, that would be painful. That would be a painful drop for a lot of people. A lot of people would probably get stopped out on their margin on that one, but it's very possible. If this resistance line doesn't hold, I personally don't see anything now, any safety net really till 47,000. Interesting one to see how this goes, but it could always bounce back. It's very unlikely. This is quite a, a short term bearish pattern. It's definitely not a bearish pattern long term. I can tell you that for sure. And one chart that I saw the other day, which I thought was quite hilarious, was this chart which shows all the Bitcoin cycles in comparison to the famous um, new paradigm graph, the phases of a hyped stock uh, visual graph. I think everyone would have seen this graph, this red line, which shows how stupid human behavior works, how we get a lot of enthusiasm, greed, we head to the new paradigm, and then eventually just everything breaks down. Well, the past two cycles of Bitcoin have actually followed this pattern quite well. Uh, the green line here being the second possible one, which almost followed it perfectly. And the blue one being the first halving cycle, which didn't follow it as good, but you can see where the pattern is there. It just got the timing a little bit wrong. And right now, this black line is where we currently are. And again, this is just for me. Cryptos are very, very, very dangerous. Please do not just follow stuff like this blindly. Get your head around this and get your attitude to risk right. Be willing to lose whatever money you're about to put into this or whatever money you might put into this. For me, I've put 1% of my money into Bitcoin and Ethereum. I'm not willing to risk anything more than that. But I do have quite a strong conviction on these. I'm just, I know my risk. I know how stupid I would feel if I lost all of my 25 grand if I had just took all that money out and dumped it into Dogecoin. I'd feel proper stupid right now. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to risk what I'm willing to lose in this situation because essentially this is a gamble. I'm, I'm doing it based on hundreds of years of human psychology, but I am also gambling at this point because I don't believe there are too many fundamentals other than psychological fundamentals which are holding up Bitcoin right now. Just my personal opinion, not everyone agrees with that. Fuck you. Thank you very much for watching everyone. The investment app that I use is called Trading212. If you wanted to get into investing, you can sign up through a link in the description below. If you sign up through that link, you can get a free share that's worth up to 100 pounds when they open again. Also, I trade my Bitcoin on eToro. You don't have to do that. You can use Binance or whatever. But if you do sign up to eToro through the link in the description below, you really help the channel out and you really help me out with that as well. Feel free to join our completely free Discord. There's lots of people talking about a lot of different things. There's still a lot of really good SPAC investors who I believe do really know what they're talking about, to be honest with you. These guys do a lot of work in there, but there's lots of different channels where we have loads of really good debates. 
<laughs> and Dick there calls me Mr. Noble Briscoe. We have loads of good chats. We talk about loads of different things, loads of people sharing, lots of research. It's a really, really good community. You can also check me out on Instagram where I post loads of different news articles. I also post every time I make a buy and sell. Maybe some Eagle Eye Trading 212s might have seen that I sold Unilever the other day. Unilever, I just didn't have the confidence in anymore. If I'm honest, I do think Unilever is ready for a big rebound. I just didn't really feel the stock anymore, so I decided to sell out of it and make use of the money elsewhere. And with that money, I bought some BAE systems, I bought Legal and General, Raytheon Technologies, and some Tritax Big Box. Trying to maybe move a little bit more to the British side a little bit. You know, I'll save myself from some of that withholding tax. And if you fancied it, we've moved the Playing Footsie podcast over to its own channel. If you wanted to listen to us bang on about stocks and loads of stock market news, have a lot of different opinions, a couple of arguments, we do all of that on the Playing Footsie podcast. There should be a new episode out tomorrow. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. And if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to like, subscribe, and invest. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. The sucker's going up.